Kurt, Brian Rothstein, Aton Shander, 97.3 ESPN. Good afternoon, sir. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on, and happy, uh, what, 29th birthday, whatever we're up to. <laughs> Kurt, you know me better than that. We've worked together before. I'm 26. <laughs> There's not there's, sorry, there's not a line I'm in my face you. right now. I can smile and it looks like a plate. All right. Yeah, you and me both, huh? <laughs> An old plate. Exactly right. <laughs> a shattered plate. <laughs> a cracked plate. Yeah. What did you make when you first saw the story, uh, the alleged beef between Jimmy Butler and Joel Embiid, and how has that story progressed in your eyes now since? You know, I don't know how much of a beef it was as like you know, East Coast, West Coast rappers or something, so much as it was just... Well, people died over North those North beefs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so fortunately, we haven't reached that level right. yet. No, it, it, so this um, is not Gilbert you know, Arenas bringing guns into the locker room yet, right? Oh, gosh. No, no. Yeah. You, and you, Just as a side note, you have to wonder, like, how would John Wall's career be different if that wasn't the environment he entered the league into? <laughs> anyway. That's a good um, point. Uh, I, you look... It's a, it takes a while to adjust to playing with superstars. I mean, the easy examples here are just like every time LeBron James goes somewhere, they start off slow because it's just, you know, you've got to, everybody's got to figure out how to play with LeBron. There's some of that here. It's, he's not feeling comfortable, you know, and Bede's not comfortable compl- completely where he's got to be, but they've got to find a way to get him paint touches and make him comfortable, yet have him still spacing the floor. And I think once they can add some shooters to this roster, even more shooting, you know, then he won't be the guy who's got to space the floor as much. So I don't I don't think it's that big a deal. I think this is just part of the process of getting used to having, uh, you know, a, a new star on the team, and especially a guy who's going to have the ball in his hands a lot. It's just it, this was never going to be a perfect. It looked great those first few games, and everything came together quickly. But it's just never that easy. All right. So you brought something up in your answer that I'm curious about, and that's adding more shooters. There are really two main opportunities for this team to bring in a name of note. And that's still trading this year and the offseason where they have some money, depending on what happens, of course, with Jimmy Butler moving forward, Markel Fultz, that money most likely coming off the books. So with that said, how much do you think the Sixers could make a move in the regular season with what they have and maybe that Miami Heat pick as some real currency kind of looming because this team just doesn't have the depth to compete with Toronto or Boston? No, but you got to be careful. That is a big chip, that Miami piece. You want to make sure you're using it for the right things. And the guys available at the deadline, like you're not, you're, you're not throwing that at Trevor Ariza, although he could help. You know, you're not throwing that at at some of the guys. And the the other problem you're going to run into both now and a little bit this summer is just that there are 29 other teams that want more shooting. The, the Warriors want more shooting. Everybody wants more shooting right now. So. That just it puts a premium on those kind of guys and why you want to keep JJ Redick. I'm not sure that of the you know look J.R. Smith isn't a guy you need to bring in right now and the kind of shooters you need. I just don't know how much there's going to be on the market because you look at the teams that are out there, especially the West right now, where there's literally 14 teams that think they have a shot at making the playoffs. None of those teams are sellers right now, and maybe that changes a little bit in a couple months by the time we get to the deadline. But it tightens the market up because Sacramento isn't selling; they're buying. Um, you know, so it just there's there's going to be a lot of demand, and if somebody who can actually shoot the rock becomes available, the price might not be worth it in the short term. Kurt, I want to backtrack here just for a second because I want your opinion on just a little bit more of Embiid's comments. So. He was essentially saying there's no beef, but he doesn't feel like he's utilized how he should be utilized right now. And I want to know what you're seeing out of their play, specifically since Butler has arrived. Do you agree with any of that at all? Because in my mind, I feel like he's he was kind of trying to find a cop out after his poor performance in Toronto. And now those comments surface after that game and. You know, so basically, I just want your thoughts on what you've seen from specifically Embiid and Butler and how Brown has been incorporating Butler and what this offense looks like now in your eyes. I mean, just to st- statistically, and I haven't looked. I looked at it actually right after that game. I haven't looked for a, a couple of games. Um, he was actually getting more paint touches per game, like one more paint touch per game than he was before. And I think the post-ups might be down a little. Um, but they're using him a little more in pick and rolls because that's, uh, you know, he, he he's so dangerous on the pick and roll because you can pop out and you can space the floor and, and against teams that want to drop their big, which Toronto does when Valanciunas is out there. 
um, like there's a real value in that. But it's first off, I watched Toronto in person last night. That's just a tough team to play against, man. They're just good. And they just they, they were without Kawhi Leonard, and they whooped the Clippers good. And the Clippers have been playing pretty well. I mean, so everybody's been looking bad against them. And I think that you're right. I think there was some frustration there. But I think that they're using them a little more in pick and rolls, and they are using, you know, guys are getting, they're running some two-man game, and Jimmy Butler's got to spend some time waiting around in the corner and being a, a floor spacer. And Jimmy, and uh, Joe Embiid's going to do a little of that too. And I think it's just an adjustment for everyone. And I think, by the way, Brett Brown, and I don't think, you watch them, Brett Brown's still experimenting, right? I mean, he's just still yeah. like, what lineups work? What, now, how many, hey, we Kurt, this, I, I've we been having this that. conversation with you for the last five years about Brett Brown is still experimenting with lineups. Verbatim. Well, but it's a new lineup. <laughs> Every it's year lineup. it's a new I mean, lineup. Think, well, welcome to the NBA. But, yeah, th- but it's also, I think that the, the mode changed. That, you know, look, I think that there was an organizational belief that they needed to kind of start Fultz and back him. And, and then they trade for Jimmy Butler, and you're like, all right, T.J. McConnell, you're in. Landry Shamit has been what, great, and you've got to get him run. And, again, he's a guy who can provide shooting. Fultz can't. So let him go rehab wherever he's rehabbing um, and, and figure it out. You you know, I, I think that they're still just it, mid-season. They kind of changed focus, and that changes a little bit of how you're going to break these rotations out, although he seems to be settling in a, a little bit on what he wants to do. Yeah, I kind of want you to elaborate a little bit more on the rotations, Kurt. And, you know, guys like Furkan, guys like Mike Muscala. Yeah. They've had some games where they look really, they look like a legitimate role player. And then there's other games where you're saying, geez, this team, <laughs> after the top three, it really gets thin. Obviously, the J.J. Reddicks of the world and some of the key role players. Outside of those guys, the bench is really short, which is why, obviously, Aton poses the question of who do they trade for, who's available, what assets yeah. you know, can they potentially give out in a trade. But what are your thoughts on their current role players and how Brown's using them in the rotation? Yeah, yeah. With all due, look, you've got to give up to get, and I I do that trade again in a heartbeat. But that's some depth. Like you could count on Sarge and Robert Covington. He's changed the defense in Minnesota. You know, I don't think there was any question the guy can defend, and he's you know, he, he, he seems to be able to get through to to Carl uh, Anthony Towns at least. So I mean, you you're losing a couple guys, and it's not that Jimmy Butler doesn't help, but it's a different role for everybody, and. So yeah, there, it is a lot thinner, and I think that that's that's part of it. You're asking Furkan and and Muscala and all these guys to kind of step in and do more. And hey, welcome to having a young team with you know younger, less consistent role players. These are these are not guys who have established that they can do this night in and night out, and they're going to have to learn on the fly and do it fast or be replaced. And again, we'll see what kind of players come available via trade does does a team like Miami decide to get into the trade market and, and they've got some you know maybe they've got some veterans you know they're not going to put um you know, Josh Richardson available but they've got some nice long guys that they might consider like it just depends on who decides to be sellers and right now outside of like hey Kent Bazemore in Atlanta or something you know there's some guys in Atlanta they've already obviously moved court and, and Cleveland's moved Corver and stuff but you look at those teams there's just not a lot of those teams with the kind of guys that are going to help you right now moving and you need you need a couple teams preferably in the west to fall off and start thinking you know san antonio or sacramento or somebody to fall off enough that they decide all right we should be sellers and then then some guys would come available that could pitch in kurt healan joining us ryan rothstein eight on shannon Riff from mike gill sports bash 97.3 espn kurt let's look at tangible improvement that sixers fans can expect this season where can Joel Embiid go from right now to the end of the season and tangibly improve on the floor as opposed to just generic, hey, he's got to get better here? That's a good question. Um, well, that's the first time in a while you've it. given me that's a good question. Yeah, it's your birthday. Yeah, well, no, I did. It's true. Yeah, exactly. That, <laughs> true. Yeah, Don't give him any more ammunition, Ryan, that he needs. <laughs> it's too easy. That's <laughs> Yeah, then that was the Christmas present too. So enjoy it. That's all in one. Um, <laughs> well, we also celebrate Hanukkah. In my I was family, just going to so say Hanukkah. Give me my I'm whole sorry, entire I, December I, I, gift, I was, all wrapped in one. Exactly. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm not buying you. I'm not telling you you were. It was a good question eight times. So enjoy that. Yeah, take the one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love you. <laughs> um, that's actually, but I mean, 
he was playing kind of, and still is playing. I think defensively, he's got to keep it up and really take over on that that end of the floor as a shot blocker and a quarterback on that end now uh, to to solidify that end. If they're going to, the, I, I've already said, I think the top four in the East, it's going to be so much fun because it's so much fun with the matchups. And maybe you're half a step behind right now, but it starts on the defensive end. You've got to be locked down. Um, and Joel Embiid as the quarterback shot blocker anchor in the middle is part of that. He's got to be kind of vocal and get guys in the right spots. Offensively, I like the idea personally of, you know, and we've seen, I don't know, Golden State's done this in the past. Other teams have done this in the past. I want to get him a couple touches early in the game, down the block, let him bully somebody. And, it, and when the help comes, or if, if it's, a, you know, when the double comes, Look, he's a good passer. You come out of it. You start your offense that way, but you've got to get him involved and in the flow and feeling like he's a part of it. And then when later when you ask him, hey, can you step out for a second and, and, and space the floor a little on the wing, he doesn't feel disengaged by it. Um, and I, I, I think I would like to see him shoot fewer threes, get a few more touches in the paint, but also, you know, hey. Part of it's just mental, man. Part of it's just, hey, you've got to accept the role in the new reality. Things change, and you're not going to get the same touches in the same places quite as often now. You know what, Kurt? Before we end this, I have to ask you a Fultz question here. <laughs> and I want your <laughs> thoughts on his current trade value. Because I've been having so many arguments and debates and conversations with all types of people on – a lot of different things. Should the Sixers trade him? Will the Sixers trade him? And then the big thing that I want your opinion on is what is his current value right now in the trade market? Like how many GMs out there are saying, we'll take a risk on him? I mean, I know there's a few, but then what is that risk? What could the Sixers get back for Markel Fultz in the next three to six weeks? I'm not sure right now there's a first. Um, I, I even a, even a low first. I, I think right now you're talking about a couple of seconds, and, and and obviously a player to match the salary. In their case, if you can get a player that can actually help a rotate, you know, a valuable rotation player um, that that fits that, then it, you know, so you got to remember Fultz is making close to mid level money. You might be able to get get a couple picks and a player who can help you right now. Um, but I don't know that there's a first out there for him it's just the values like you said there's not many people in there and the value is really low there's teams that i'm kind of you know you've heard it i've heard it i mean, you know i'm sure you guys have heard it there i've certainly heard it from sources there phoenix doesn't want to be in the in the martel fultz game which by the way makes no sense to me like they want to they're like trying to trade a reza for guys who can be more helpful now i'm like why well i mean is phoenix even still going to be playing in phoenix He's such a screwed up organization, but I mean, to me, that's the kind of place you need to set. Uh, you you want to work a deal with just for him, for his sake. He needs to go to a small market without much media, without much glare, because that's certainly not Philadelphia at this point. And just let him. There might be a good player in there if he gets some time to develop under the radar, away from everything, with a good developmental program, which maybe is not Phoenix, but send him somewhere that can develop young players well and maybe maybe we start to see what Fultz can ultimately be but I just don't think he can do it in Philly I just right now that like you said the trade there's a few GMs that would take a shot but they know there's not much of a market for him and man NBA GMs are vultures they're just they're gonna they're gonna wait for they're they're just gonna wait for the worst deal they can they can possibly get away with and right now maybe somebody comes around with something a little better but right now the offers are they're not taking the offers because the offers are just um Hey, Kurt, real quick, 30 seconds. We were having this argument yesterday, and I think it's more for Mike Gill than it is for Ryan. On a scale of zero, ain't no way in hell, courtesy is probably putting it nicely, to 10, you know what? That sucker was as close as it got outside of the Lakers. How close was it really for LeBron James coming as a sixer? Three or four. Maybe. I mean, it was, oh, it, you're I, being I, I, generous. Was that meeting you're a courtesy? You're being generous. Kurt, was that meeting a courtesy meeting? Yes, I mean, that was a polite. That was a polite. He decided a while ago, before, obviously before July first, where he was going and what he was doing. That I don't, you know, for what, whether it's for business reasons or whatever. I think it was a bit of a courtesy meeting. I think that there, a, a year ago, there might have been some interest. Like I think that there was a genuine look at this about maybe. But by the time it got to the summer, by the time we're talking about, 
if, if you want to know on July 1st, it was down to 2% or something. You know, Magic Johnson had to walk in there and, and, and blow it, which is, you know, <laughs> I could come up with fun scenarios for that, but no, sure. you know, that's not what's going to happen. Um, Aww. so by, by the time it got to July, he had made his decision and look, all the evidence points to that's the way he was leaning for a long, long time. It was going to take, again, it was going to take the Lakers doing it wrong. Thanks brother. Appreciate you jumping on today, man. Hey, happy birthday, man. Take yeah, care, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. <laughs> Kurt Heelan, NBC Sports, pro basketball talk on NBCSports.com.